Let me welcome our viewers and listeners uh, to this uh, discussion on the effects of the uh, Russian uh, aggression on uh, Ukraine and the effects on the world order. It's my great honor to introduce uh, our, the speaker of uh, this event, uh, Iam Brzezinski, who's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation. So it's a pleasure to be here. My first uh, question to frame uh, the issue would be uh, regarding the world order and how the re Russian aggression on, on Ukraine has changed our, our world in 2022. In the previous years, we were discussing uh, the, the, the central uh, European vision, what we can expect, what we should hope for in terms of peaceful cooperation in the region of, of Hungary. Unfortunately, and, and we can talk about how expected or unexpected this, this aggression was, um, but now we are sitting here discussing a war uh, once again in, in Central Europe. So first, let me ask you, from your perspective, how did the world order change in 2022 because of the Russian aggression? And how unexpected this, um, this occurrence was um, from your perspective? Well, that's a big question and an important question. And of course, the outcome of, of this war uh, will ultimately determine its impact on international order. But no question, much is at stake. I mean, just think about it. Ukraine's sovereignty uh, is at stake. The sovereignty and security of a European democracy, one of the most tolerant European democracy, uh, is threatened by overt and an overt and brutal aggression by Putin. You know, the fact that he, that President Putin has decided to attack Ukraine is a direct attack on the rules-based international order and one of its fundable, fundamental principles which is respect for the sovereignty of, of nations, of other nations. And if Putin is allowed to prevail, we're going to find ourselves on track to a world that is dominated by spheres of influence and military coercion. Uh, you know, I'd argue that also Russia's own evolution is at stake. And Russia is a significant country. Its evolution as democracy and an international actor is going to be shaped by the outcome of this war. And here I hark back to my own dad, my father, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who used to emphasize that Russia cannot be a true democracy if it continues to be an empire. And if Putin is successful in resubordinating Ukraine, destroying Ukraine, it will continue to be an empire and therefore not a democracy and therefore not a constructive, cooperative actor, international actor. Uh, you know, Moscow's resubordination of Ukraine by brute military force would just preclude its transition from its hegemonic past. So a major power's own evolution is at stake. I'd argue that NATO's credibility is at stake. Now, Ukraine may not be a member of NATO, but what the alliance does and does not do in this, in this conflict, what it does and does not do successfully in this conflict, will have an impact on its credibility. For the simple fact that Ukraine is a European democracy, it's a democracy, a European democracy has contributed actively to NATO missions, both in Europe and, 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 and beyond. And it's technically a, uh, a country that NATO has said will one day join its ranks. So NATO's, will be, NATO's credibility will be profoundly affected by the outcome of this conflict. And I'd argue even more you know, on a fifth kind of point, which is this conflict is gonna shape the role of nuclear weapons in interstate competition, an in interstate conflict. Now think about it. Putin has been actively using nuclear coercion to preclude Western intervention uh, into, this, into this war. And to, to a certain degree, he's used that nucle his nuclear threats with success, with the alliance saying that it will not send allied forces in, in, into Ukraine, the United saying, States saying it will not send U.S. forces into Ukraine out of fear of provoking World War III. That is a success for Putin's nuclear coercion. And other countries are watching carefully, particularly China. Uh, so, you know, the impact on the on international order has been a negative one. The outcome is still to, to be determined, 
but clearly much, much is at stake. And we face a world today where there are a number of conflicts and catastrophes, but this one will have the most immediate and profound impact when it comes down to military stability and conflict, not just in Europe, but globally. You've mentioned that the outcome is yet to be determined. And until now, how do you ever evaluate the reaction, not of the Western state, because it seems like there's there are two blocks of countries, the transatlantic community and, uh, and the, the US Pacific allies who have reacted very strongly um, to the Russian aggression. How do you ever evaluate the reaction of other states, China, India, and I know that um, um, the, um, uh, um, the American administration is making efforts to get uh, African countries on board um, in order to uh, sanction or at least condemn the Russian aggression. How do you see the the world um, breaking up, at least in the in the in the last few months, into this kind of blocks of countries when it comes to um, how they position themselves? Um, to the Russian uh, actions? Well, there are, you know, there is a coalition of some 30 to 40 countries that are taking active measures to support Ukraine through the imposition of economic sanctions and through the provision of military equipment and financial assistance to, to, to Ukraine. Uh, it, it is notable that that coalition constitutes largely the democracies of the, of the, of the Western world. And one could argue the most powerful uh, block of countries when it comes down to economic and, and military power and democratic legitimacy. It is very unfortunate, however, that a large portion of the world's nations are basically looking at their shoes, not taking an active um, a role in, in supporting Ukraine, not taking an active role in punishing Russia for, for its aggression. And, and that is disturbing. And it's a reflection of how the international rules-based order isn't as really as strong as we would like it to be. Uh, and it's a failure on the part of these nations uh, to recognize how important international rules-based order is to their own security. So it's short-sightedness on their part. To a certain degree, it's a bit of reflective of a certain bit of selfishness on, 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 on their part. So it's a reality you point out. But I would argue the West still has more than enough political, economic, and military capacity to ensure Ukrainian victory if it would exercise the political will to do so, even though so many countries are basically looking at their shoes. One group of countries that, that I would like to, to address before turning to the, to the actions of the, the Transatlantic Alliance is the uh, the states neighboring Russia on the southern side. And for many analysts, um, it was a surprise that countries including Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan were not actually supporting uh, the Russian um, actions uh, recently, but trying to, to play a more, um, more disattached uh, role, role um, when it comes to Russia. And it, it, it was kind of a surprise, at least as far as I understand uh, in, in Hungary, that, that these countries, which, which uh, we thought that they belong more to, to a, a Russian camp, if, if we may call it, um, they did not. And, and uh, they, they do various um, uh, actions that are against the Russian interest. Are you... Um, was there any feeling on the U.S. side that these countries uh, are less attached to Russia, and there's a, a, a glimmer of hope in some sense that uh, that that uh, the Russian actions are not going to be supported by these countries, or or it, or one who who was looking at the the actions in the post-Soviet sphere understood that these countries indeed have a freedom of maneuver uh, or mobility when it comes to uh, maneuvering themselves between the West and between. Uh, Russia. These countries that border R R Russia's southern periphery, the other states, the former Soviet space, so, so to speak, are watching very intently uh, what Moscow is doing and what the West is doing, and particularly the United States. Uh, 
you know, they're watching what Moscow is doing carefully because they're very concerned they could be next. And they are, you know, they're probably a bit shocked. They're probably not that surprised. Um, probably shocked at the brutality of what Russia is doing to Ukraine, but probably not surprised by, you know, the intent that, you, that, that Putin has. They know Putin as well as anybody does. They live on the border. They deal with Russia economically. They've been subject to both economic and military pressure from Russia. They're terrified by what they're seeing in, in, in Ukraine. So it's, it's, it's not surprising to me that they are not supporting this. And it's not surprising to me they're being very cautious in how they, they, they voice and quote unquote exercise their opposition uh, to this invasion of Ukraine by, by Putin. And they're watching very carefully to what the West is doing because of, they're going to make a judgment on, on the West's response. And the West's response is weak. Their willingness to stand up against Putin is going to be less. If the West's response to Russia's aggression against Ukraine, its invasion, is strong and robust, they're going to be more self-confident in pushing back against uh, Putin's efforts to subordinate their countries uh, to, to Moscow's dominion. So yeah, it's, I'm not surprised by, by, by their reactions. They live next door. They know many of their leaders know Putin personally. They know what's at stake. But if there are two areas of foci that they have their eyes directed at, it's what Moscow is doing because they're afraid that they could be the next target. And they're looking to the West to see how robust the West response will be because they know that their ability uh, to, to counter you know, Putin's ambitions in their neck of the, of, of the woods will be profoundly affected by what the West will be willing to do to support them. So let's turn on, on to the issue what the West is doing and, and, and uh, the, the, the transatlantic alliance. Um, you've mentioned that the decision will be made by many countries uh, on their reaction based on how weak or strong is the, the, the Western reaction. And you also mentioned that the goal is for Ukraine to win. So when it comes to the previous month, how do you evaluate uh, the reaction of the Transatlantic Alliance and, and our global partners in aiding Ukraine in their war um, to, to achieve victory over Russia, over the Russian aggression? Well, when you look at the transatlantic community's response, um, you know, there are some positives and negatives. You know, on the positive side, there is a, a fairly robust uh, international coalition supporting Ukraine. They're providing a lot of economic um, assistance to Ukraine, a substantial amount of military equipment to Ukraine. They've established a remarkable supply chain for that military equipment. I think it's nearly all NATO allies that are sending equipment in one form or the other uh, to Ukraine. And by, by nearly I'm concerned that Ukraine, excuse me, that Hungary isn't part of, 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 of that group. The economic sanctions are, are fairly robust. Uh, they've been able to control the narrative internationally about this war. There's no ambiguity internationally that this is a overt Russian attack. It's unjustified. They've been able to highlight the brutality of, 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 of that aggression. And that certainly hasn't been to Putin's uh, benefit. But I am concerned that um, you know, the response that the West has had to, to, to this aggression hasn't been as swift and as decisive as it needs to be. The West was slow to recognize the clear signals of Putin's intent that go way back to the, you know, 20, the spring of 2021 when Russia was building up its, its, its forces in preparation for this attack. The West didn't respond. It didn't really deploy significant forces in response to that. It didn't build up its military presence in, in, in Ukraine. It didn't impose any sanctions on Russia for, for that aggression. And then in the run-up to February 24th, the international community kind of abandoned Ukraine. I mean, just speaking of my own country, we withdrew our embassy from Kiev. We withdrew our force, military forces from Western Ukraine, as did, as did others. That was basically a green light to Putin, uh, and certainly a signal of a lack of confidence in Ukraine that had to have been a terrible uh, signal for the Ukrainians. Our strategy in support of Ukraine has unfortunately been consistent with our overall approach to Russian aggression over the last decade and a half, which has been a strategy of incrementalism. I mean, think about it. 
Russia has invaded Georgia. It's invaded Ukraine twice. It's assassinated uh, people in Germany, in, in, in Berlin, in, in Ukraine, and elsewhere. It's conducted sabotage missions against uh, military storage sites in, in, in Bulgaria and, and elsewhere. Uh, it's been harassing Western forces on the high seas in the air. Uh, you know, what has our response has been? It's been incremental economic sanctions, marginal military buildups. Same with the attack on Ukraine. You know, our military assistance, while it's fairly robust now, was slow to gear up. That kind of strategy of incrementalism, it communicates hesitancy, a lack of unity, a lack of determination, maybe even intimidation in the face of Russia's military threats. And that has only emboldened Putin, given him more self-confidence and increased his willingness to use military force. And I understand the background for, 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 for the strategy. You know, there's always a desire for unanimity among our allies, there's a fear of provoking uh, conflict escalation. But the fact of the matter is, is that strategy of incrementalism denied Ukraine the ability to deter Russian aggression, and it denied Ukraine the momentum it needed really in the first phase of the conflict to not only to beat back the Russian forces in front of Kiev, but out of Ukraine, period. And I fear today we're basically keeping Ukraine barely alive in, in, in this conflict. We haven't really given it the level of assistance it needs to decisively counterattack and push Russian forces out of its territory. So that, that's my assessment of, of, of our support to Ukraine. We're doing a lot, and you know, leaders like Biden should be applauded for that. But we also got to, we cannot avoid the basic question, is it enough for Ukraine to truly prevail with confidence? And I'm not quite sure we're there yet. So what do we need to be doing? Which I think will be your next question. We should be imposing a full trade and financial embargo on, 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 on Russia. It's amazing to me today, and Hungary's part of this problem, that it, we continue to buy Russian oil and gas. And at current prices, Russia's earning more on oil and gas exports than it did even last year. So every molecule of gas that Hungary or Germany or any country digests you know, is additional funds for Putin's aggression against Ukraine and elsewhere. We need to do more to reinforce NATO's eastern frontier, shifting our strategy from a tripwire defense to more a strategy of a robust denial, strategy of denial, deterrence by denial. We need to accelerate the flow of military equipment, ammunition, and other supplies to the Ukrainians. And I would argue that the West ought to actually be deploying forces in Western Ukraine to create a humanitarian no-conflict zone, a place where refugees can go for safe harbor, a zone that would more effectively enable humanitarian assistance to the one-third of Ukraine's population is displaced by this war. It's a step that would reinforce the territorial perpetuation of Ukraine, something that Putin's de determined to destroy. And it would allow Ukraine to concentrate its forces more effectively against the Russian aggressors. Some say there would be risk of uh, conflict escalation through such a move. I, I doubt it, because such a securing of a no-conflict zone would not involve attacking Russian forces. The ball would be put in Putin's court and whether or not he'd want to attack those forces. And I don't think he'd want to. He's having a tough enough time against the Ukrainians. He wouldn't want to go against a far more superior NATO or Western force that was deployed to protect refugees. So those are the things that uh, we need to be doing and we need to be doing with greater determination and swiftness. So you have mentioned that, that one of the reasons for this more gradual approach is the need for, um, for agreement between all the, all the allies. So would you imagine something like a parallel coalition of the willing uh, format to, to give more um, support to Ukraine, which is actually, in effect, happens because we can all the time hear that NATO is um, um, deciding on, on something, but then the United States is giving a, a special delivery of weapons to, to Ukraine. So what would be the format? Because I would also like to ask you, how do you see the recent uh, NATO summit in Madrid in this regard on uh, bolstering uh, NATO defense in the East? So how can you 
bring together on the one hand NATO's defense and on the other hand the support of Ukraine, how these two issues are, are connected. Well, when you look at the Madrid summit, that was a very important summit and made some important decisions. You know, on the positive side, uh, the alliance made some decisions to kind of shift its strategy from a tripwire defense of its eastern frontiers toward a strategy of deterrence by denial. That is creating a force posture on its eastern frontier that would uh, basically prevent the Russians from crossing the border, so to speak. Uh, the, the current uh, posture is a tripwire defense in which basically we have forces that are forward deployed, but they're not strong enough to really de to defend against uh, a Russian aggrance, but they would be pushed back. And then eventually later, a more mobilized NATO would then push the Russian forces out. But as we've seen in Ukraine, the devastation Russian forces will do on, 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 on the territories it occupies is, is completely unacceptable. So the alliance decided to reinforce its, its eastern frontier by increasing what are basically battalion level deployments to brigade levels. And that's, that's important. It's expanded its air defense uh, capacities with, a, with an air shield uh, operation stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea, and that's a positive step. It's not quite what, what one would, it's more, more of a robust tripwire defense, but a step toward a strategy of deterrence, and that's a positive step. It's also decided to expand its NATO response force from what is roughly now a 40,000 uh, uh, personnel, air, ground, and, and, and maritime force to a 300,000 uh, personnel force, which will, they say will, they will try to, to, to accomplish within a year or, or two. And that's a big, big goal, but a step in the right direction is the right objective for the alliance to take on. That's an, those are important decisions, and, and those are good decisions. I'm a little concerned that the NATO alliance didn't, the NATO summit didn't yield much for Ukraine. NATO's, NATO's role as, as an institution in the defense and the, or in the support of Ukraine still is next to nothing. Uh, NATO ended its training mission in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, it has no formal role in the provision of military assistance to, to Ukraine, military equipment. And at the NATO summit, they, they agreed to increase some engagement or initiate some new engagement with Ukraine, but largely in the form of providing uh, assistance in the realm of civil military relations and ministerial reform, which is really marginal and really not relevant to the, challenge that, the challenges that Ukraine faces today. Uh, I wish the alliance would play a more active role at a minimum in, in the channeling of military equipment and assistance to Ukraine. It should be doing that. That would be an important um, symbolic move uh, on, on part of the Western community. It would also marshal NATO's vast capacities to, do, to provide such military supply chains, which it could be very good, which it is very good at. Um, but you know, the NATO summit unfortunately didn't um, didn't make that decision, and its uh, its actions on Ukraine at, uh, unfortunately were were marginal, and that sends the wrong message to Putin. Unlike NATO, uh, the European Union has made some historical uh, decisions on on supporting Ukraine with with weapons, something that even those uh, analysts who were watching the development of the European Union's um, common security and defense policy uh, for years did not envision that in a few months uh, the European Union will take such a robust um, role. Uh, countries such as Germany has made finally the decision to, to become a normal state in terms of spending a, um, a minimum amount of um, of uh, of funds to to its um, its defend uh, it, it, on its defense uh, according uh, or in line with the NATO um, NATO um, requirements. Um, so, how do you evaluate the role of uh, the EU in this in this conflict? Uh, can it be a substitute to NATO? Uh, you've mentioned what you would expect or or hope that that NATO will do or, or encourage, um, but what the EU is doing in the last few months can it be a substitute or or that's not or or the eu cannot be a substitute for nato uh, when it comes to supporting ukraine and defending uh, the alliance on the eastern front 
The EU is an important organization and what, is, what it's doing economically uh, for, for Ukraine is important. Um, I'm glad that it's finally put Ukraine onto a formal track for membership uh, in, in, in that institution. Uh, that's more a rhetorical step than, than an operational step. I just talked to the Turks uh, about how long, or talked to the Albanians and the Macedonians, how long it takes to get into the EU. Uh, but still, it's a step in, in the right direction. Symbolically, it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, and it's an affirmation of their, at least their willingness to embrace Ukraine's aspirations to become a full member of the European community of democracies. But, and it's important, the military assistance that, 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 um, that the EU is providing Ukraine is helpful. But the EU will never match NATO in terms of its ability to marshal transatlantic consensus and action and military support. Uh, so they're, they're two different institutions. They bring different strengths. Uh, you, EU sh strengths will always be primarily in the political and econo economic domain, and NATO's uh, strengths will be primarily in the trans ability to marshal transatlantic military resources and capacity in the defense of uh, you know, the alliance's interests and values. Let's turn um, to the to the specific um, region of, of Central Europe, and and uh, of course, when we talk about Central European cooperation, we are hoping for peaceful cooperation. But unfortunately, we are talking um, in a in an environment of uh, of a war, of uh, actually a, a great power attack on one of the the Central European countries. So, from your perspective. Uh, what what can be the special role of of Central Europe in this conflict? Can we speak of a Central Europe in this conflict, or is it the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, Romania, separate countries with separate interests? But is there something which which unites uh, this region when it comes to um, to the Russian uh, aggression on, on on Ukraine? Can we adopt a specific uh, Central European perspective on this this issue? I think so. I mean, first of all, the Central European states are frontline states, or I should say Central and East European states are frontline states. They border Russia or they border Be Be Belarus. Uh, they're right on the border of, of, of Ukraine, which is now the immediate target of, of, of Putin's ram, ram, revanchist amb, amb, ambitions. You know, Poland is in many ways playing a role somewhat similar to that of West Germany during the Cold War. Romania and Slovakia are kind of close, close behind in that. And by that, I mean, these are countries that are kind of right on the, uh, on the border of the zone of, 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 of conflict. And they are the primary uh, conduits for economic and military assistance, primarily, primarily Poland. The Baltics, they're providing outsized levels of military assistance for their size. I mean, it's amazing the amount of equipment the Estonians and Lithuanians and Latvians have provided uh, Ukraine. One could make a very good case they should be, in light of Putin's revanchist ambitions and his now demonst repeatedly demonstrated willingness to use military force against his neighbors, they should be holding the, that equipment for themselves. But out of their solidarity uh, with democracies of Central and Eastern Europe, they provided you know, their own Stinger missiles, their own ammunition, uh, their own vehicles uh, to the Ukrainians. It's really, really impressive. Sadly, Hungary doesn't really kind of stand with that crowd. It's not providing military assistance to Ukraine. It's actually been an impediment to the EU's ability to impose more robust economic uh, sanctions against Russia, particularly the energy sector. Uh, you know, an another factor that, that's common to the, or distinctive about this community of nations is that they're all post um, uh, sort of post-Soviet states, po or states that were previous, you know, not too long ago, three decades ago, occupied uh, by Moscow, subordinated uh, to, to, to the Soviet Union, if not within in the Soviet Union. So they have a kind of unique experience uh, and understanding of what's at stake uh, in Putin's aggression against Ukraine. And that gives them uh, a distinctive role in the transatlantic community and the global response to, to Russians, uh, Russians' aggression. You know, what can they do specifically? Well, one, uh, 
they can we they can do what they're doing now, which is providing economic and military assistance to Ukraine. I mean, these countries have been giving their own equipment to the to, to the Ukrainians. One could argue at their own at their own risk uh, to their to, to their ability to defend themselves. Uh, they're serving as conduits. Uh, they're serving as homes for the Ukrainian refugees. The warmth and compassion. Romanians and Poles and Balts and, and then many Hungarians have provided to Ukrainian refugees is, is truly, truly inspirational. They can be a powerful voice for Ukraine's aspirations to join the EU and to join NATO. And they should, they should voice and continue to push uh, support for, for, for those aspirations. There's the three C's that they've created. And I think it this is a real unique effort uh, to accelerate the development of cross-border infrastructure across Central and Eastern Europe uh, to facilitate the integration of the, the infrastructural integration of these nations among themselves, but also within the wider Europe so that Central and Eastern Europe becomes a truly integrated part of the single European market. It's a profound initiative. It's a unique initiative that has a, uh, a really innovative approach to leveraging the power of a private capital to drive forward infrastructure development. They should extend that this initiative to, to Ukraine. Ukraine should be made a full member of, of the Three Cs initiative. And uh, you know, the Three Cs is therefore in a position to kind of really start positioning itself to be an important part of Ukraine's infrastructural reconstruction once the war um, once the war ends and there's sufficient peace. In, in that country to enable those kind of economic undertakings. So th that's what to me, in my eyes, makes Central Europe a kind of a distinctive um, a region when it comes to supporting a, a Ukraine. And those are three or four areas where the Central Europeans could work together to help Ukraine. Let me um, focus on the Three Cs initiative um, for, for a question because when we were talking about this issue in previous uh, uh, online conferences in, in recent years, um, from my perspective, it was not that apparent that certain funds that uh, the Central European region was looking forward to, um, including um, uh, Chinese infrastructural investments, um, at that time, it seemed like there's a competition between between funds, and the Three Cs initiative is one of the one of the um, um, one of the, the initiatives. It seems now that that the European Union and is the is the is the one main fund which is present in the Central European region. Um, the the Chinese economy or or engagement with the outside world has been um, at least. From a Central European perspective, uh, there are a number of countries which have shifted their their China policy. It's less uh, relevant uh, right now. Um, so it seems to me that there's kind of a, 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 a opportunity or a, or a special uh, time uh, for the um, the Three Cs initiative in that terms. So you've you've said that Ukraine should be made a full member of of the Three Cs uh, initiative. How do you see the development of that plan in time of war? Um, can you, you've men also mentioned that Western Ukraine could be also uh, already be uh, in some uh, sense uh, included or or have closer uh, connections to the to the to the other regions in in Central Europe? So can you envision that that in the short run the CCS initiative um, can have an effect? On, on the region, that, that things can be moved forward, or this is more midterm and long-term uh, uh, future in your view? Well, I, I think symbolic, the symbolism of bringing Ukraine into the three Cs is, is powerful. It's a demonstration by an influential and credible community democracies, the Central European democracies that constitute the three Cs initiative to, to embrace Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations, and they're doing it by bringing them into their own, you know, unique co co community to keep uh, Ukraine, which has expressed interest in joining uh, the three Cs, to keep it at arm's length. It sends the completely wrong, the wrong signal. It is true you cannot really do infrastructure projects uh, in a war zone. 
And so unfortunately, I think the ability for the three C's to, to initiate a cross-border uh, infrastructure project with Ukraine will, 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 be, will be challenging, but possibly not, not impossible, um, depending on, on, on the circumstances. So right now, it's really kind of an initiative that, that could be undertaken to signal solidarity with, with Ukraine, to set a precedent for other institutions to follow, like NATO and the, and the EU, and to basically take steps now to be prepared, to be more effectively prepared for the moment when actually nations and companies can actually go back to Ukraine and start reconstructing uh, infrastructure that's been destroyed and building new infrastructure uh, whose needs are long overdue. One, one of the key issues, of course, when it comes to um, the reconstruction of, of Ukraine, um, the, the eventual uh, reconstruction of the, of the destroyed uh, infra infrastructure, is the state of, of Ukraine. And, and you know the country very well, you know the region very well. So how do you see right now, we are having the discussion on, on the 10th of August, uh, how do you see right now the, the situation um, in Ukraine um, we are almost at the end of the summer, um, the, on, both on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side, we understand that there are um, preparations for, um, for, uh, for um, uh, military actions, naturally. Um, but how do you see, where do we stand in this, in this conflict after um, more than five months of, of the war? Look, we're, we're five and a half months in, in, into, in, 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 into this war. And... If I had to project about its future, I'd say the most likely future was, is a long-term conflict, perhaps stalemate, uh, that features perhaps gradual Russian um, advances in Ukraine. And I say that because when you look at the balance of power between the two countries, it's quite imbalanced and perhaps to the favor of Russia. Ukraine has a population of what, some 45 million? One third of its population is now 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 displaced, and the GDP, you know, Russia's population contracts is what 140, 145, 145 million. Um, Ukraine's GDP, I think, in 2020 was somewhere around 120 billion dollars. Russia's was at 1.4, 1.5 trillion dollars. Ukrainian GDP. From what I've recently read over the last five and a half months has dropped 45%. Russia's GDP has only dropped, uh, you know, eight to 10% or some figure like, like that. So when it comes down to basic geoeconomic and geopolitical mass, Russia has, has a lot of advantages. Now, Ukraine's been getting some important economic assistance um, from, from the West. And has been getting more and more uh, military equipment, increase, increasingly advanced military equipment. But I'm not convinced that that level of assistance is at a has reached the point where it's going to enable Ukraine to undertake a really truly decisive counterattack to regain its territories uh, from, from Russia. So I fear we're kind of entering a phase where it could be kind of a long slog uh, in which these two countries grind each other away. But, you, but the Russians having the advantage of mass. And that to me is, is very, very worrisome. And I fear that in a situation like that, time is really to the advantage of the Russians, to Putin, rather than is the Ukrainians. You've mentioned um, in the beginning of, of our discussions that, that Russia is heading towards a, a future which is even more alarming than than its present um, because of the political uh, movement. So I also want to ask you, without of course um, cheering or, or or being worried for for um, for the aggressor, but what do you see um, um, in the future of Russia if they uh, head down in this in this direction? Because one one fear that that from history, actually my my fear. Is um, is that we saw in the First World War the Kaiserreich uh, Germany um, what happened with it, but then it reinvented uh, itself and became uh, Nazi Germany and having much more military successes uh, than before the the Kaiserreich uh, Germany. So, 
in some sense, and you have alluded to to a, to an even more negative future for Russia. So, what is the the fear that you that you have? Where can Russia end up if it continues? And can you um, mention what would be a positive uh, future when it comes to how to reintegrate Russia if it changes its course? Look, th this war is going to have a profound effect on Russia's evolution. If Putin is allowed to prevail, if he ends up uh, winning Western acceptance of, a car of another carve-out of, of, of Ukraine, Putin Putinism and its revanchist dimensions are going to be further entrenched uh, in, 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 in Russia. That's going to be a Russia that's more aggressive to towards its neighbors, more confrontational to, to the West a more destabilizing actor uh, within the international community. And, you know, that outcome will not only affect Russia's evolution, it will affect the actions and evolutions of other countries. And I'm, I, I'm looking, speaking specifically of China, which is really watching closely what's going on uh, in, in, in Ukraine today and watching closely the progress that, that Putin is making in his invasion of Ukraine. There, you know, Beijing is drawing conclusions about the West's tenacity, its determination to stand up for the international rules-based order, uh, the, the, the determination behind its, you know, Western enunciations of commitment to defend democracy. They're watching very closely how Ukraine, how Russia is using its armed forces, including military, including nuclear threats uh, to shape the West's response uh, in, in defense of of, of, of Ukraine, and they're drawing conclusions about how that will, will affect their aspirations, their potentials when it comes down to Taiwan. Uh, so there is, a, a, <laughs> there is a lot at stake in the outcome of this war that goes just beyond Russia's own, own evolution. My thinking is if that Putin is decisively defeated in, 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 in Ukraine and is basically pushed out of, 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 of Ukraine, that will be a huge blow to Putinism. Uh, that will that that will weaken Putin's uh, grip on 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 Russia, and it will increase the likelihood of or propensity and, and the prospects of Russia's ability to transition away from you know a, a basically authoritarian hegemonic state to a more democratic, internationally constructive state maybe even a democracy that can have a normal relationship with the rest, rest of the world. That's why this, this conflict is so important. It's going to profoundly not only affect Ukraine's future and the credibility uh, of the alliance, but also Russia's evolution and the actions of other major powers around the world who are watching this conflict very closely. Um, a follow-up question regarding China. Um... We have been speaking mostly about the, the European and transatlantic response um, and the need for a global global action uh, condemning and, and acting against Russia. A specific question of mine is that oftentimes it's um, it's uh, mentioned or, or thought about that a Pacific NATO or something like that would be useful. So in your view, how important it is to mobilize the U.S.'s uh, Pacific allies, uh, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, New Zealand, in this um, in this uh, war uh, against um, uh, against Ukraine uh, conducted by Russia, or those are allies which will be more important when it comes to countering Chinese ambitions, and that's and and the so. Is there enough, if I may say it like this, political capital to to have? Uh, the Pacific allies backing when it comes to Russia, but also have them there when it comes to uh, China? Well, clearly, when it comes to you know, China, is they're going to be their most immediate concern. And it, it's, it's a very legitimate concern in light of the aggressiveness of Chinese actions in, in the Indo-Pacific region, be it against Philippine territory, Filipino territory, Vietnamese territory, not to mention Japan and, 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 and Korea. And there have been some actions uh, being undertaken, largely led and driven by the United States, to help mobilize a more co coherent Indo-Pacific response to Chinese aggression. This goes to strengthening the U.S.-Australian uh, relationship, strengthening the U.S.-Japan relationship, 
the creation of AUKUS, uh, a deepening the, the new Quad uh, involving India and Australia and Japan and the United States, all geared up to kind of create a more effective, coordinated, multidimensional response to Chinese aggression in, 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 the, in the region. In, in response to you know, Europe, your question about you know, what the transatlantic community should be doing, I think it's very important for the transatlantic community to, to act in a coordinated way in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Europe has interests too at stake in what, uh, against Chinese aggression. The international order is being challenged by Chinese aggression. Europe has a stake in protecting that international order, not only just on the basis of, of moral imperatives, but even just pure economic imperatives. So it's going to be important for the transatlantic community to stand as one together, uh, not only against just Russian aggression, but also Chinese aggression. And we saw s signals that the alliance is heading in that direction uh, through the, new, the alliance's new strategic concept that was rolled out uh, at the Madrid summit in which it identified China as a, as a strategic challenge. And my hope is that we'll not only see a deepening of the alliance's relationship with some of its Indo-Pacific uh, partner states, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Mongolia, but also a, a, a more regular and perhaps more robust actual alliance presence in the Indo-Pacific. It doesn't have to be quote unquote militarily de decisive, but enough to demonstrate to the Chinese, the Chinese government, that Europe has military skin in the game, so to speak. That will enhance the credibility of the threat of using Europe's economic um, capabilities against Chinese aggression should that become a re re requirement. It's going to be important for the United States and, and Europe to stand together across a full spectrum of, 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 of action in the Indo-Pacific, just as important as it is important for the United States to be fully involved with Europe in countering the full spectrum of Russian aggression in the European theater. And I might add that if you're a European that is determined to sustain America's presence in Europe, it's going to be very important for Europe to have some military presence in, 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 in the Indo-Pacific. Because if, to do otherwise, it's creating a division of military labor in which the United States you know, would leave Europe to defend against Russia while it takes care of what some in the United States would argue is a more complex and a, a more significant challenge in the Indo-Pacific. And such a division of labor militarily would lead to basically the decoupling of, of Europe and, and the United States. And that would weaken the transatlantic community's ability to take on challenges posed by Russia and for that matter, challenges posed by, by, by China. So, you know, a military investment in the Indo-Pacific is an important um, investment to make because its returns are not only from the Indo in, in, found in the Indo-Pacific, they'll be found, so to speak, in the European theater because that's an effective way to sustain American military presence in, in, on the continent. Thank you. And for the, the final um, question, I would like to, to conclude with, um, you've mentioned um, what, um, um, what the in the Indo-Pacific, um, a, uh, a more participation would be important. But from your perspective, um, what would be a near-term and long-term uh, positive future for Central European U.S. cooperation in the context of the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war? What are the most important areas that you think that in 2022 and forward, uh, the Central European region, our countries, including Hungary, um, has to cooperate with the United States in order to achieve a, a more uh, peaceful uh, future? doing more to support the Ukrainians militarily, uh, if not through um, some sort of uh, presence in, in Western Ukraine, then through increased uh, security assistance to, to Ukraine, uh, economic assistance to Ukraine, uh, that's gonna be critical and increasingly urgent. Uh, and then also supporting Ukraine's transatlantic aspirations, which is of course, membership in the in NATO and membership in the European Union. We have to make these the, these these statements of, of by the EU and NATO uh, 
that, that quote unquote Ukraine's that that that, that um, that's embrace Ukraine's transatlantic transatlantic aspirations. We have to transition that from rhetoric to real action, and that's where the United States and the democracies of Central and Eastern Europe can be quite effective. Thank you very much uh, for the enlightening discussion and, and sharing your insights into this uh, complex topics. Um, thank you, and we hope to um, to speak with you in the future about um, these uh, complex issues and, and the follow-up. So it was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much.